Uh, welcome to Parev TV. We are very excited to present today's program, an interview with Dr. Heike Mardirosian, a political scientist, a politician, who was recently elected uh, council member of the uh, National Democratic Alliance, and we'll be hearing and learning more about the National Democratic Alliance, which is a political movement in Armenia. Uh, once again, uh, hi, let, let's be informal because we have a long way to go today. Uh, yeah. uh, I know you are moving in America, in the East Coast and the West Coast, trying to give disseminate information about the, the uh, political movement. Uh, so let's start with what is the uh, message of the Armenian uh, National Democratic Alliance? The message is that the Armenian people have gone the wrong way for the past 100 years. Of course, the Soviet rule was a period of occupation. We didn't have much choice. But in the past 30 years, it was our choice. And we chose to continue the previous 70 years legacy of uh, political domination uh, by Russia over Armenia and humiliation, and then uh, followed by the treason both internal treason and external treason by the so-called ally of Russia, ally Russia. Um, the message is this, that uh, if you do something all the time, uh, you do the same thing, you cannot expect any different results. It's time to change the uh, political vector of Armenia, the foreign policy direction. It's also time to change ourselves. But most of all, it's time to wake up from, from the deep uh, uh, sleep that uh, we are in as a result of uh, the disastrous war. Uh, we are losing the Armenian statehood. There is essentially no state anymore in Armenia. It's a failed state, both uh, officially according to all the political definitions and also practically. It's a completely failed state. No matter we believe in that here in diaspora or we don't, we choose to reject it blindly. But it is a matter of fact that it's a failed state. There should be an exit from this situation. Otherwise, we are going down forever. Uh, therefore, the National Democratic Alliance has come with this message that we have to think over uh, the change of foreign policy first, second, uh, we have to do certain reforms inside the country itself. But in order to achieve all of this, the first step should be the removal of this treasonous regime, uh, uh, which has no other alternative. Removal has no alternative. Mm. Uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, key points in our uh, policy, which is uh, uh, transitional justice. Um, uh, it's also lustration or declassification of the former Soviet and then post-Soviet uh, security service networks and the agents' networks who have served Russia, essentially. Uh, one of the most key uh, points on our agenda is the declaration of the legal continuation of the First Republic of Armenia, but we have gone even further recently. We think, and our approach is that there has been no First Republic, no Second Republic, no Third Republic. There has been one Republic only. The First Republic, 1918, 1920, and then the Republic was occupied. The country was occupied by Bolsheviks and Soviet Union later on. Uh, and you cannot count the Second Republic as a Republic. You cannot count this republic as a republic because this is the continuation of the first republic and it is a failed republic because it was turned out that it was never essentially free and independent. But most of all, it's not about semantics. It's not about uh, numbering. It's not about symbolism. It's more a practical approach. It's a practicality and a, a legally uh, legally practical approach. Why? Because the legally recognized borders of the first Republic of Armenia, i.e. the only Republic of Armenia, uh, have included uh, many territories lost to illegal occupation by Turkey and Russia. Mm -hmm. 
and Azerbaijan, notably the whole Artsakh and Nakhijevan, have been and still are legally parts of the Republic of Armenia. Mm -hmm. But under the pressure and under the direction of the Russian authorities for the past 30 years, the Russian regimes, the two essentially regimes that have uh, you know, continued each other, uh, the Armenian regimes, starting from Ter Petrosan regime, have adopted a policy of separatism, i.e. separating Artsakh from the Republic of Armenia itself, falsely proclaiming independence in Artsakh in order to make it uh, an object of negotiations between Russia and Azerbaijan, not Armenia and Azerbaijan, but Russia and Azerbaijan. And we see the results. We saw the results last year, 2020, uh, uh, notably, uh, when Artsakh was taken and legally it was presented to the world because the Armenian authorities never objected as part of Azerbaijan just basing that fake fact on the fact of transition or transfer of Artsakh from Armenia to Azerbaijan by Stalin's signature only by the decision of Kav Bureau, the Caucasian Bureau of Bolshevik Party. So if we uh, continue the tradition of the First Republic, if we accept that we are the occupied and later on semi-deoccupied Republic of Armenia, everything falls in its place. And we have no legal or international problems with the recognition of Artsakh as part of territory of Armenia, which will give us uh, an opportunity, a foothold to pursue this matter in a different way when the historical moment comes again to liberate our not only historical lens, but also legal lens. And the other uh, key issue, as I mentioned before, is the foreign policy. We recognize that under this 200 or even 300, if we look any further, uh, Russian occupation of Armenia has resulted only in loss of territories during 300 years, but notably during the past 100 years. And especially when Russia or Russians, first Bolsheviks, and then uh, this time the Kremlin have uh, been completely in charge of Armenia or for Armenia, they have given away our lands to Turks as a result of their deals because Turkey and Azerbaijan have always been and will always be way more important for Russia than Armenians and Armenia. And they always, their policy is always making uh, a backdoor deals and giving away lands of Armenia. And we saw that during this war, we are still seeing these things. Therefore, the National Democratic Alliance has one of its key points in its agenda as the shift of the foreign policy vector from Russian domination to alliance, not domination, but alliance with the West. And first of all, with the United States, we recognize that it's very nice. It sounds extremely great, beautiful, you know, amazing to say that, oh, we need to become stronger. We need to get stronger by, by ourselves. We have to get there. We, we, were, we, we have been unable to do that. Mm -hmm. And Russia will not let us do that unless we bring in an, a, an ally that was an ally 100 years ago as well. That was the major ally, uh, along with the UK, the United States of Armenia. And it's only US in the current world, in the modern world, that can help us uh, build a strong and powerful country. Why is US interested? Because US is not interested in a stronger Turkey than it is now. US is not interested in getting a second China, a second Russia um, uh, in this region um, in terms of uh, Turkey's uh, unification with uh, other Turkic nations. And Armenia is the bottleneck, you know, uh, stopper um, on the way of uh, the greater and um, uh, invincible, essentially invincible Turkey. If Armenia is eliminated by Turkey and Azerbaijan, 
the Turkey is going to become unstoppable and uncontrollable even by its NATO allies. That is why France and United States, first of all, are very much interested in preserving Armenia the way, at least the way it is, or giving it more power in order to enable Armenia to survive. Because in this physical borders, which are not Armenia's legal borders, these are physical Bolshevik Russian Soviet borders imposed upon us by force, Armenia cannot survive. It is a fantasy. Hi, I, let me just say there's a lot of stuff you covered, but let me go more about what I read today, this morning. And I would like to quote uh, Lukashenko, uh, the Belarus president, who said that the ex-Soviet republics somehow must get together under Russian rule. And he said, let me, and I'm, I'm just quoting, he says, Armenia has nowhere to run to, do you think anyone needs Armenia? What is your reaction to a statement like this, which many people say Armenia has nothing to offer? On, based on what will any other country want us? It's the traitors, the cowards, and the idiots in Armenia and in diaspora that say Armenia has nothing to offer. Of course, Armenia has a lot to offer. It's, uh, its strategic position. Of course, if we lose Sunik, then yeah, I will agree. There will be nothing to offer anymore. But Armenia is a crucial point on the map of not only South Caucasus, not only the whole Near East, but the whole region mm. uh, and uh, the whole region at large. Uh, Armenia is at the crossroads of major uh, communications, uh, uh, transportation communications, but also political and geographical. It's a geographical and political hub. I told you, most of all, the biggest importance of Armenia in the eyes of the world, and notably the West, is that it acts as a roadblock mm. on the way of Turkey to become a major uncontrollable world power. Nobody's interested in that. Nobody. Second of all, Armenia is an island, both culturally and also potentially politically, for the West in this particular region. Armenia has a lot to offer, just the same way as Armenia had a lot to offer 100 years ago when Woodrow Wilson was defining Armenia's legal borders based on international law, based on a mandate given to him by the predecessor of the UN of the time, the League of Nations. Why did he support Armenian Armenians so much? Because again, it was against Turkey's recovery. The US was against Turkey's recovery. US saw the aggressive stance and the aggressive policies of Turkey, which are exactly the same today. Therefore, Armenia has a lot to offer. But if we say we don't have anything to offer, that means we put ourselves in a situation, in a position from which there is no way out. And yes, that is a way under more uh, destruction by uh, towards more destruction under Russian rule and towards uh, uh, more uh, becoming a subject of trade between Russia and Turkey. We have, this is a very, this is a terrible message, but this is also a good message in terms of it enables us to see how they, the Russians and the Be Belarusian leader who tries to reconstruct the Soviet Union, uh, resuscitate, revive the Soviet Union uh, with the Kremlin, it is a good uh, message in terms of uh, that it enables us to understand what their policy is. They want to destroy us completely. They want to establish 100% control uh, and uh, uh, make another deal this time about Sunik, then it will be, of course, Yerevan, because who needs Yerevan if Sunik is gone? I mean, Yerevan will have no meaning if Sunik I, is gone. I, yeah. you, you mentioned the Wilsonian uh, maps and Wilsonian promises. Ara Papian had the same message to us. We keep hearing these messages. The question is, these were promises and promises where at the very end, these were not kept promises because of the business interests 
of America or any superpower that has interest. The question is, they will have to take care of themselves like Russia is taking care of itself. My question to you is, you have been, let's, I would like to move ahead. You have been very active in the Serge uh, Sarkisian's uh, government and also a major supporter of uh, uh, Pashinyan during the Velvet Revolution. Then later on, you turned against Pashinyan. Tell me what went wrong. First of all, uh, let me clarify, I have never been very active in Serge Sarkisian's government. I have been the chief aide well, to the prime minister who worked, who was in the government of Ser Sarkisian in 2016, but that work has lasted 30 days only, one month. And I have resigned promptly after Dmitry Medvedev's visit when we hosted him in the government. Mm -hmm. And that was right after an, a, a result of a four day April war of 2016. Mm -hmm. So my disagreements uh, became so strong uh, during 30 days that I decided to resign and I resigned and I immediately went into opposition. Um, uh, before that, I never cuddled with, uh, uh, never caused it up with uh, the government. I was criticizing it, but then I went into the government because uh, I was promised freedom to act. And my logic was, in a situation when you have a dictatorship that's going to last, and the impression at that time was that those regimes are going to last for the longest time. So my approach was it's better to get inside, try to do at least little things for the start, for the beginning, from inside to help the people, to help the country in some way. Uh, but when I saw that the promises are falling through, that everything was a lie, and also seeing what happened during the four-day war, Russia's role and how Armenia is going more under Russia and some other disagreements as well with the head of the government, I decided to resign and I went into the opposition. Therefore, I have always been true to my beliefs and that's why I have left everything at that point and become an opposition mm -hmm. uh, from there on. What comes to Pashinyan, mm -hmm. it's not only me, it's 99.9% .9 of the Armenian people worldwide. Most probably the number, the number is symbolic, but most probably it's that big. Uh, supported not Pashinyan, but they supported the so-called revolution that turned out to be a non-revolution. It turned out to be a special operation by Kremlin to replace Serge Sarkisian with Karen Karapetyan, and along the way was hijacked by uh, their actor, uh, Nikol Pashinyan, who, who made a deal with Russians to become the prime minister and most obviously offered them to do anything on their behalf. And I believe he even over-delivered more than Karen Karapetsan was planned uh, uh, by Russia to do. Uh, I was the first one to go against Pashinyan uh, in late fall 2018 which is the same year as the so-called revolution or the non-revolution as we call it, because I saw that he is deviating from the way promised, that he is betraying every single promise that he had given coming into power, that he's lying to the people. My last meeting with him was in a hotel in New York when he was the prime minister and he came here, he had a speech at the Yale club here in New York and after that meeting, uh, uh, about two months later or three months later, I started criticizing him openly. Before that, the criticism is internally. Um, that's what happened. And again, I stay true to my principles. And I think, uh, and I think that uh, it's a good thing. I, I got a lot of criticism at that time. But right after the war, people realized how right I was. Unfortunately, I was right. I wish I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go back to your first statement regarding the so-called Wilsonian Armenia or the legal borders of the Republic of Armenia. Calling it a Wilsonian Armenia is more a symbolic thing, but there is legal, uh, legal borders. There are legal borders and there is first Republic and or the Republic of Armenia. Let me... Uh, uh, disagree strongly with your statement that it, the promises were not kept, it was abandoned because of American interests, etc., etc. No, 
nothing like that ever happened. You cannot pinpoint any event or anything that America has betrayed Armenia. That didn't happen. Uh, what happened was the Republic of Armenia ceased to exist with its original government, legal government, because it was taken over by the Bolshevik occupying regime, by a gang of Bolshevik crooks and murderers who came into Armenia, who took over by force over the government. And on the other hand, Kemal was reconstructing and resuscitating Turkey. And neither Bolsheviks nor Kemal were recognized powers. They had no legitimacy at that point, but they took control over huge swaths of territories of Armenia. And after that, Bolsheviks made a deal with Kemal in their own interests. It's Russia who betrayed Armenia, not America, and divided Armenia in between themselves. What were, were what are Armenians expecting, uh, looking back, uh, America to do? Uh, bring forces into Armenia and fight for Armenians in that period when America was not the superpower it is today, mm -hmm. when it didn't have the influence it has today. Uh, you know, I mean, why do we call it a betrayal by America? America did everything so that Armenia stands on its feet. But the what thing did, is, what did America do during the 44 day war? Just a question. Okay, uh, it did a lot. It offered to place um, Scandinavian peacekeepers in the region. We was a counter offer uh, to Russians, what Russians had offered. Russians had offered Russian forces, which are not legally peacekeeping forces. According to international law, they are not peacekeeping forces. They're occupying forces, mm -hmm. okay? First of all, that offer by uh, O'Brien, uh, which was made in LA's uh, press conference, was immediately rejected by Pashinyan mm -hmm. because most obviously he had to deal with Russians and Turks and Azerbaijanis. Uh, America has offered non-lethal weapons as far as we are concerned Mm. Uh, to Armenian government, and Armenia has refused to America. Uh, French, uh, certain French high-ranking political figures have confirmed to me personally uh, during my visit this uh, last year um, uh, to Paris that France has offered non-lethal weapons, uh, i.e. air defense systems to Armenia, and the Armenian government has rejected that help during the 44 year. So if you have a treasonous regime, nobody can help you ever. Don't forget that Trump was president during the 44 year, uh, 44 day war, which means that the isolationist policies of the US White House, and I don't wanna call it the government, but the White House policies of that time uh, uh, were preventing America from interfering more. Secondly, we need to understand one single truth. Armenia is the slave, is the political slave, is the servant, a voluntary servant, is the so-called ally, official ally of America's greatest enemy, Russia. Mm -hmm. Therefore, why would America come to your help if you reject American help, if you go and kiss America's enemy's feet if you have served them for ages and your people have never expressed will to become allies with America. And regardless, America has done something amazing and truly unprecedented in international politics has still offered help to Armenia and Armenian people. Who is preserving Sunik today? Whose ambassador is traveling to Sunik every other week almost, figuratively speaking? Who is allocating money and assistance to Armenia? It's America. It's also European Union. Why are they doing this? Is Russia doing it? No. Whose responsibility is to return the POWs to Armenia? Whose responsibility is that? Who's the third party signatory to the act of capitulation of Armenia? 
to Azerbaijan. Who is the author of the text? Russia. Russia is the guarantor. Russia does nothing. America has returned, has helped to return 15 POWs, prisoners of war, from Azerbaijan. Russia does nothing. You know, so therefore, we shouldn't be blaming America. We shouldn't be acting like fools and blaming the only power that's able to save us at this point. Yes, again, returning to what I said, it's very nice to think that we can become powerful and etc. We have failed in doing that for the past 100 years, especially the past 30 years of the so-called independence. We will be unable to do that now by ourselves. While America is not a colonizing force, at least for the past 40, 50 years at least, uh, it has never uh, destroyed its allies. It has never betrayed it, its allies anywhere else. If somebody will speak about Trump betraying Kurds, that's a different story. That's Trump, that's Kurds, that's not a state, but also that's not uh, the regular American policy. And let's not forget that what comes to Kurds, it's an example why I'm talking about this, because it's an example that Armenians serving Russian interests, um, representing Russian interests and being acting as uh, uh, agents of Russian interests in army and in diaspora always speak about this issue with Kurds and Trump, uh, forgetting that it is State Department and the Congress that forced President Trump to reverse its policy of uh, betraying the Kurds. Therefore, that was not American policy. That was the White House's policy of that time. Today, not only the White House, but also the whole US government, the whole United States of America are the only uh, uh, real, true partners along with France and European Union of Armenia. And it's them who preserve Armenia and its physical borders in order not to not to allow Turkey unify with Azerbaijan and go any further and become a huge regional force, a competitor and a threat to American interests. I, you are a political scientist, you're a politician. I read you loud and clear. You're very, very clear. You're very uh, clear. But let me just say the International Republican Institute, I don't know if you know them, conducted the poll in Armenia just to figure out what do people think about Russia, about America, economics, politics. And it was surprising to me, maybe not surprising to you, maybe you think it was all fixed, but many people still think Russia is our best friend. Many people think our economies are intertwined, we depend on them. We had an election, Pashinyan won. This was the voice of the people. In the diaspora, many, many people or many organizations have over the last century have said, Whatever government is in Armenia, that is the government we support. How do you expect us to change that? What kind of a mental revolution should we go through? Or what do you expect of us? Thank you very much for a wonderful and very important question, Vartan. I'll try to go point by point. First of all, uh, the poll uh, doesn't show complete support for Russia amongst the population. It is declining. It is declining. declining yeah, yeah, but still it has the top, yes, yes. It, it is declining big time. It's very, very much visible. I can tell you based on my personal experiences inside Armenia, and I spent uh, a lot of time last year in Armenia, uh, that even many people who have been traditionally pro-Russian, they have believed in all those uh, brainwashing, you know, processes that have gone with um, the Armenian people inside Armenian in diaspora, that Russia is the ally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they have seen what has happened. Go to Artsakh, conduct an amateur poll, even an amateur poll in Artsakh, and you will see who they support now. They don't support Russia. They are the first to see it firsthand, the war, they experience it on their skin. And they, Artsakh, know very well the uh, part of uh, the, the Armenians who live in Artsakh. They saw who was the responsible party for, 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 for the loss in the war, who allowed all of this to happen, who brought Turkish forces officially on the ground of 
Armenian Artsakh and placed them in Akna, which is called Akdam in Azerbaijani, and established a monitoring, so-called monitoring center, which is a surveillance, air and space surveillance uh, center of Russian and Turkish forces, and they surveil Armenia, uh, including Artsakh, because Artsakh is part of Armenia. Uh, so Artsakhsis understand that. Yerevansis also understand that. Kapansis also understand that. Shiraksis also understand that. So there is, of course, a part of population who's not politically savvy or who's been brainwashed. Don't forget, for, for 300 years, Armenia is under Russian occupation. For the past 100 years, exactly 101 years, Armenia is under complete Russian dominance. For the first 70 years, part of Russia itself, uh, with no sovereignty, nothing. And for the uh, following 30 years, under complete Russian uh, control, which has only uh, gotten stronger and stronger. Therefore, you will always have people who will love the destructive metropolis because the metropolis has conducted a brainwashing operation and has put in place uh, four consecutive regimes that have been agents of their influence and that has sought legitimacy only in Kremlin, not in Yerevan. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, again, support for Russia is declining. We are the first political movement that has uh, flown American flags in Armenia, that has flown European Union flags in Armenia, that has flown Indian flags in Armenia, because we see India as an ally as well. Mm -hmm. If you go back two years, you it is impossible to imagine that it would have been tolerated by anyone to see an American flag flying mm. in Armenia two years ago. Because thanks to Russian uh, propaganda, America was seen as evil. People who would speak anything good about America were seen on the political scene, I mean, were seen as you know, agents of America, something bad, right? Now we fly the flags. We fly all the American flags. We fly even American military flags. Uh, uh, we flew them uh, during a rally in front of the American embassy, uh, a support rally for. But, American but you don't have the responsibilities of a government. You no, no. Let, let me clarify. The, the government flies just one flag, Russian flag. The government even sent troops to Syria under Russian flag. Not but, Armenian flag, but because, Russian flag. Yeah, because we are um, we, because we are cornered. We have nowhere to run, and somehow yes, we you are do have you do have one. No, you do have one way to run. You are cornered, but that's exactly why you should run to the only exit that you have, which is the Western world, which is the civilized free world. You have to run towards that direction. That's where your salvation will come from. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's your only choice. Why, unfortunately? Because it would have been great if we didn't need to run anywhere at all. If, you know, Armenia would uh, be able to be uh, independent, get stronger by itself, be friends with the West, of course. But this is the only way you have to go now. Now, but let me clarify. Let me answer all your questions one by one. Uh, therefore, now people understand. People themselves fly American flags, which is a symbolical thing. People understand what America did 100 years ago, what America is doing today. And those who don't understand, they are coming to the realization of this fact. It is a fact now. So the public attitude is greatly changing. It is changing. Everybody knows this in Armenia. Yes, there are still many people who don't say Russia is an ally, who used to say that, but who say, you know what? Russia is an enemy, Russia acted like an enemy, but you know, we have nowhere to go, we, America doesn't need us. These people don't understand the reality, but they already understand the first part of the reality. And they will come to the realization of the second part too. They understand that Russia has sold us off to Turkey. Now, to the second question. You said that this government was re-elected, that Pashinyan was re-elected. No, he wasn't. Well, international bodies accept. How do you elect it any doesn't government? doesn't matter because nobody was able, 
because nobody was able to register fraud on a large scale because the mechanisms of fraud yeah. and election rigging yeah. have been so well you know polished yes in the later years according to certain credible reports hmm. and analysis of certain specialists around 250,000 votes of dead people and people who have immigrated have been cast in this election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look at the picture, who got into the parliament, it's Pashinyan, it's Robert Kocharyan's regime, which is a, a Russian proxy, direct proxy in Armenia, his party, his bloc, and it's Ser Sarkisyan's bloc, mm -hmm. also a Russian agent bloc. They got into the parliament. Nobody else, not even Pashinyan's proxies. Why is that? I, because Kremlin was the decision maker in this election. It is impossible that Armenian people would go and they would choose only three powers, the three powers that have, destructed Ar that have destroyed Armenia. Pashinyan, Kocharyan, and uh, Ser Sarkisyan. Do you believe this? No. Russia wanted to have a parliament in order to pass all the ratification of the future documents to come through the parliament effortlessly and not to have even a slightest hint on, of opposition inside the parliament. Therefore, we believe, and many people do believe, that these elections were greatly rigged. But the technology is different. The rigging doesn't happen uh, mostly during the day of the election. It happens pre-election and post-election period. And you cannot see that. Then the international observers come, they just register what they saw. They I don't conduct I deep investigations. Now, let me give you one more example and pass to the other one. Uh, sorry, just to finish no uh, the thought. Uh, we, the National Democratic Alliance, was a participant in these elections. What happened, I can give you, and we have presented these facts to the attorney general's office, which is called general Prosecu prosecutor's office or something like that in Armenia. Mm -hmm. There are constituencies, there are election points where we have, let's say there are 200 votes, we have 30, right? There is a document stating that we have, let's say 30, 40, whatever, 20, 10 signed by everybody who has counted the votes on the spot. A day later, the next day, Central Electoral Commission announces the official results. That same location, National Democratic Alliance received zero votes. And we have presented around a dozen cases that we were able to track. We didn't have many people in all the regions. So it was very hard to control what was happening with our votes directly. But it is a matter of fact, and we have presented. Where is that investigation? Nowhere. Where did it all go? Nowhere. Was it a rigged election? You be the judge. Now, the last question, you said something very important, that the diasporan organizations or many diasporans yeah. have traditionally said that no matter what the government in Armenia is, we, in order to support Armenia, we have to work with the government. Shame on them and shame on those idiots who keep on doing that now. And I uh, have to unfortunately register that the absolute majority of the diaspora organizations are consisting and run by idiots and morons who do this, who enable the treasonous regimes to give Armenia away who don't uh, implement any accountability mechanisms, who do this for photo ops with their leaders of Armenia, who enable Armenian regimes to use the resources of diaspora without any accountability to diaspora and to the Armenian people, and who close, who shut their eyes in front of what crimes the regimes have been doing and are still doing, you right? Know, I, I, you're very eloquent and very passionate and I think you have a lot of good points you raised. 
But when you cross the line and go a little bit too extreme, call people idiots. No, that's not extreme, Bartan. I think you're it's losing points. We have... I think people get turned off by these remarks. I don't care, Vartan. No, truth you is have to truth. care if you it's want enough. to get into power. If you want to run the country, you have to care. No, no, no. We, we are not going to play hypocrites. We are not going to play hypocrites. And I'll tell you this. No, no. It, we don't count their best. Them. It's not easy. You know, it's very easy for a bachelor to talk about divorce. You're a very young man, a bachelor. You're, you're preaching no. divorce. And these people are married people, married to these organizations, married to our main interests, because these are the people and organizations that let me tell you this. Let me tell you. Yeah, let me explain my point. Let me explain my point and tell you why this is not crossing the line. First of all, it's enough of hypocrisy. It's enough of, you know, kissing hands. It's enough of all of these. There has been no use from these people or these organizations for the country. There has been use for them or for the regimes, right? Okay. Now, the war was such a shock. Yes. The war brought us yes. to the end game, to the point from which there is, it's a point of no return. We're standing at that point. We are on the path of self-destruction and destruction, of annihilation. That happened because there was no accountability on the part of the regime and on the part of the diaspora leaders. And I'm not calling this the diaspora. I'm calling out the diaspora leaders. Not everybody. I said 99%. There's 1% still. That's good. What was going on in here? Uh, now, there is just one political power in Armenia. That's National Democratic Alliance. That's speaking the truth that's speaking shocking things like alliance with America to the Armenian people. And people are receptive to this. In diaspora, majority of those leaders, even inside America and mostly inside America, they are against this only way of salvation for the Armenian people, saying that we need to work with Russia. We need to kiss their hands even more now. You know. I mean, this is idiocy. It's an idiocy. You have to call it an idiocy, right? We are not trying to cozy up with people. Let me give you a name. Uh, we asked to thank Jan one of those days to provide us with a hall for our meeting with the New York community. I would community. rather you not mention names, but if you why want not? to- but Why afraid. not? Why not, Vartan? Why are we afraid of calling because names? these are noble organizations who have done their share and they do a lot in Armenia. You say they're it's not good. enough. It's good. We appreciate what they do. But I'm AGU telling you- AGU does, birthright of Armenia does, Tufankia does. There are many Nobody cares about birthright. You're losing Armenia. It's time to act now. It's time to act now. You build a hotel. You do this. You do that. Nobody cares now. Nothing counts. You, you don't even have to build hospitals now in Armenia because those hospitals will go to Azerbaijan just the same way they, as they did go in Artsakh. I, you have I, to change I, the political... I, let me finish, Vartan, please. You have to change the political system. The only power that brings change is us. Everybody who refuses to work with us and who goes against our agenda, not us, our agenda is going against Armenian people's interests. Now, why I'm saying uh, to Fengyan? Because tomorrow we're in power, to Fengyan will provide us with his hold. Today he's not. And I'm not blaming him for that. I'm blaming him for not understanding what's happening and what is what. We don't want these people tomorrow to come and build hospitals and hotels. We will be able to bring huge investments from other countries into Armenia to build all of this without their diaspora and pennies. My point is, it's time to shake ourselves. It's time to stop being hypocrites. It's time to speak, uh, stop being photo op maniacs. You know, it's time uh, to stop craving for medals and recognition by the Armenian regimes and governments. It's time to act. In order to act, there is just one political power in Armenia. Unfortunately, I wish we had competitors in Armenia. I wish there was another major power political in Armenia who would say uh, the same things as we say, and they would come to power. It's not that we want to get into power. It's not on our agenda. We understand in order to realize these things, we have to come to power. But we're not craving for power. My point is, if we don't shake ourselves, things will go the same way as they have been. Where um, are the billions of dollars of diaspora that have been invested in Artsakh? Where are they? Azerbaijan enjoys them because of all these 
uh, uh, diasporan so-called leaders. It's crazy. It's enough. We have to call out uh, names and we have to call the things as they are. We have to name names. How, how we have will, to. How will the your policy towards diaspora differ from whatever policy Pashinyan regime has? That's a great question, and thank you very much. Pashinyan's regime is no different in those sense from the previous regimes. What Pashinyan regime is doing is taking money from diaspora, uh, also, you know, causing up with those same people who were causing up with Ser Sarkisian, handing out medals, you know, making receptions in the embassies and all these, you know, idiots feel happy. They go, they take pictures with Lilith Makuns, with the consul general in LA. They feel so happy. You know, that's all they need, right? To hang the photos in their offices and, and feel important. That's the policy towards diaspora. Our policy is completely different. We say diaspora's money has been taken. Nothing has been off offered in return, not only to diaspora, but to the Armenian people. We say diaspora's involvement in Armenia's governance shall become a primary issue. But how? We are lacking professionals in Armenia now. Mm -hmm. We are lacking uh, people who are highly educated. Either they immigrated or the current education system has killed all the possibility of having uh, you know, highly trained professionals. We are going to invite professionals from diaspora to work in all levels of government. Number one, we will eliminate uh, the barriers for a dual citizen, a triple citizen, a quadruple citizen to become a high-ranking official in Armenia. Mm. Something that Ser Sarkisan has implemented and that Nikol Pashinyan has vehemently de defended. We will eliminate that in, from the constitution. We will eliminate and change the whole constitution. We will rewrite the constitution. We will establish a democratic constitution. Now, uh, the diaspora shall feel responsibilities as well. It shall take over certain type of role of checks and balances over what's happening in Armenia. If you give money, you shouldn't be giving money for photographs with the leaders of the country or for dinners or for private calls with the president or prime minister. You should get involved and you should bring the values that you have in here. That's why we will not work with those ones that refuse to work today with us to help save Armenia, but we will work with a new generation or with those who cooperate with the ideas and who bear the ideas that we bring forward. And it's not rejectionism, it's not extremism, it's reality. We are in a catastrophe. We are living in uh, historic times and we are on the brink of extinction. We just don't realize it. We do, but many don't still. Therefore, the role of diaspora shall become bigger, the diaspora shall become uh, influential, the diaspora shall get involved in the reconstruction of Armenia. We will create situation and conditions for notable or unknown but highly professional diasporans in every level to go to Armenia, to train the people and to lead agencies, ministries, departments, uh, to start businesses. It's also related to tax policies that we're going to conduct. Therefore, the policy that we are going to implement is completely different than what has been carried in 30 years. Birthright and things like those that are very nice, are very good, but they have to be effective. They are not effective by themselves. Hi, you know, in the diaspora, the church plays a major role in the life of diaspora Armenians. Many people say, it's the church that kept us Armenians and during hard times, hard days, and there was a lot of work being done. Others claim that we have to connect with Armenia. My question to you is, what is your position with the church? I personally, I will speak on uh, my behalf or, or as, as a, uh, I'll express my personal opinion. This is not um, NDA's uh, official opinion. Uh, even though it may coincide or it may not. 
uh, we have not discussed this. Uh, uh, this has not been on our agenda, this particular issue. But my view is I see the Armenian Apostolic Church as a historic institution, as an extremely important institution, as a huge and very important network for our people. Unfortunately, it has deviated from its mission. It has become a shadow structure by itself, thanks to its leaders. And we, I believe at least that we need, and I'm sure my, my colleagues, the other nine board members most probably believe that's this too, that the church has also to be reformed completely. Uh, not the, the church as uh, a system of uh, religious belief or its religious aspects, no. As a structure that has served the regimes for the past 30 years, that has, according to certain, let me call it, serious suspicion, so-called, uh, whose leadership has served the Russian special services. We know very well that in Soviet times, the whole church leadership, yes. almost the whole, yes. was serving the KGB. I have a surprise for you. Not much has changed since then. Therefore, uh, we have to uh, help the church clean itself. We are not going to mix the state with the church, but we understand that the church has become uh, an adjacent structure to the state. We have to separate it, but we have to uh, reconstruct the church in terms of making it go back to its initial mission, which is to serve the people, uh, to serve spiritually, to serve socially, first of all, social service. What did the church do after the 44-day work? Can you tell me? Nothing. Zero. What could they have done? They, have, could, ha they, they could have helped the refugees. They could have fi financed uh, uh, with big programs, with the big money that they have, uh, the recovery of uh, wounded soldiers. Uh, they could have helped the families. They could have, if they have been an adjacent structure to the state, at least seeing that the state, the government has killing the state, they could have spoken against the government. Well, let nobody well, say the church have, is not have. political. Let, let nobody say the church is not political, right, in Armenia. I mean, the Every Georgian church is, is always... Every human huh? being is political. Yeah, that, the Georgian uh, church has always, stu uh, always stood by its own people. You know, being a democratic country, Georgia, the church has always had its say in crucial times. Here we, we saw catastrophe. We are go going through catastrophe. And what, what does church do? Tell me, where is the church? Where is the church? That's the question. Therefore, we have to return to help the church to return itself to its core values and stay true to those core values. Mm -hmm. We are not going to make it uh, an adjacent structure serving the state. No. We will help it become independent. We will keep the separation of church and state. But in order to do that, you have to help the church to cleanse itself from its, you know, uh, episcopos, bishops, from its archbishops, and, you know, higher up. Because it's, it's uh, the reputation... You know, uh, everybody knows what the reputation of those people is these days. What do they do? They still contract, construct churches. Really? Constructing churches? Where, where is the money going? The diaspora has another thing to do here. They have to understand that giving to the church is giving to nothing, is giving to the people of the church, the leaders of the church. The diasporans shall start investing in the Armenian people but not the social programs because everything is going to be lost again because of the policy of the regime. Unless you bring regime change to Armenia, unless you stop cooperating with the Armenian regimes, the treasonous regimes. What if tomorrow Erdogan is Armenia's president? You're going to cooperate with the Armenia's president at that time? You know, I mean, that's why I'm calling them out. That's why I'm calling them to shame. You know, you Therefore, know. yeah, we have to change the policy. You know, the church was destroyed by Russians. That much I would say. But the thing is, we had to build it. And today we have over 120, 200 seminarians in the seminaries of the church 
we, and that too needs money. And these seminarians are coming to United States and France and Europe and serving the church and thus serving the people. So a lot is happening. I don't want to go into deep as to what the church does. Let me just wrap it up with the issue of the Armenian genocide. There's a lot of talk about normalization with Turkey, and there's also talk with no conditions and Armenia not moving into that negotiation without making condition of the genocide. What is your take? My take is this is a pro-Turkish government in Armenia. This is an anti-Armenian government. This is a regime that carries out Turkish uh, uh, agenda. Now, uh, what does it mean going into negotiations without preconditions? Yeah, Turkey has no preconditions because all of its preconditions have been already met or are being met. They are being met and there are preconditions, one of which is the, re the abandonment of the Armenian state and also by proxy by the, di the, the diaspora that the government is going to be forcing to diaspora through those leaders that I was, in your words, crossing the line, calling them out. Uh, to uh, forget about the issue of the recognition of the genocide. But that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is that Armenia, essentially, officially, the regime, has recognized Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan by the, this person who occupies the office of the prime minister. When he says the western regions of Azerbaijan, he means Artsakh. He means Karvajar. It means all the territories that were liberated that are still part of legally Republic of Armenia, but he recognizes them as part of Azerbaijan officially. When he calls names, Azerbaijani names of the locations in Armenia, uh, when he says Chaizami, Eivazli, etc., mm -hmm. that's an official point. That's a very special point that he makes. And what do the leaders here do? They sit and they smile or they dislike it, but they say, oh, that's the regime in Armenia. We have to help them. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, the take is this. It's very clear this regime is moving according to Turkish and Azerbaijani plans. And it's, uh, we believe, it's our belief that they have a deal with Turkey and Azerbaijan, that they represent Turkish and Azerbaijani interests and they, they drive the country towards the assimilation and annihilation and swallowing by Turkey and Azerbaijan. In order to understand this, go back about two weeks ago, probably, Khachatur Sukhasyan, who's known by his nickname, Gerzo, mm -hmm. who's the most influential oligarch in Armenia today, the closest proxy of Nikol Pashinyan, and he's, uh, uh, many suspect his sponsor, um, a member of the parliament, who actually, many believe, and I say all of those things diplomatically, many believe and etc. Uh, who many believe uh, is the driver behind the policies of Pashinyan and is many believe is the intermediary between Pashinyan and the Turks, uh, gave um, a press conference, uh, a standing press conference in the halls of the parliament. Go watch that uh, video. You will understand where Armenia is moving. Turks are coming. They are going to be establishing themselves in Armenia. He said that he had essentially ordered the hospitals to get ready to prepare for the influx of Turks who will come to hospitals to get medical treatment. We understand what that means. Mm -hmm. And the whole policies are laid bare in his speech. Speaking about the massacres and the genocide, he says, so what? French have killed the English. The English have killed the French. Everybody has killed each other. Speaking about our people being killed, uh, in uh, Azerbaijani fire, not crossfire, he said uh, almost, I'm not, I'm not quoting him literally, but he said, uh, yeah, so what? Uh, we kill them as well. So it's normal, essentially. That's what he implied. Therefore, go watch and see. It's all Turkish preconditions coming to life. And part of them have been realized. Artsakh has been given. Uh, Armenia is denouncing its legal rights over its legal territories, which is not Wilsonian, which is actually First Republic of Armenia. Yeah, it is Wilsonian, but why we call it Wilsonian? It's First Republic of Armenia. Armenia is denouncing its sovereignty over Artsakh. Uh, of course, there are no preconditions. Or there are, and everything is being realized by this regime. 
Therefore, it's all a big lie. It's just another step uh, on the way to uh, becoming Turkey, part of Turkey. That's what's happening with Armenians. What do we do? We sleep. What does the diaspora do? Go look. They do kind of, I don't know, fundraisers for events. They honor each other. They bestow some awards upon each other. I mean, ridiculous and shameful. Haik, uh, I, I really thank you for this interview. I uh, think you're a very clear voice. You're very passionate. You're very convincing. There are very good points you raise. You make us think. You make us help help us turn the new page in the Armenian life. Where I, I cannot foresee the future, but I know it's not as easy as you try to put it, nor as difficult as you try to put it. But I really appreciate this conversation, which was very clear English. I know you speak also French very eloquently, and I would say you are an asset to the National Democratic Alliance. And I congratulate you, congratulate you for your hard work, and wish you well. Thank you very much, Vartan, for this uh, exceptional opportunity. I value your time. I value this airtime. And thanks for having me. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.